Hi, I'm Pete and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. The title of this video is Growing Luscious Grass. We've had the same seeding on our fields for 10 years now and the proof's in the pudding. We still have really nice grass. So this video is going to be kind of a data dump. Normally in the course of a season I'll cover what we're doing on any given day, but I'm going to show you and explain all the things about our land and growing grass and how we manage our cattle and hopefully you can get some insights from it. First things first, our farm is in central New York State. We get about 40 inches of precipitation per year. And of that, about 100 inches is snow in the wintertime. It gets pretty cold here. In the summertime, it gets hot and humid. We have 90 degree plus days, lots of humidity. And one of the things I think is most important is that we're subject to over 100 freeze-thaw cycles in any given year. And almost more than anything else farming, I found that that number of freeze-thaw cycles greatly influences how you handle your livestock. Next important thing, soil. Our farm is almost entirely Langford and Bath Boulaz. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I'll write it down below. Soil type. It's uh, fairly well drained. It's got quite a bit of clay in it. It's got lots of rocks. It's kind of a glacial soil from the glaciers, the remains of glaciers coming down here. In fact, this hill behind me is one of the things that the glaciers left behind. It's about 5.5% organic content. It's been that way since about day one when we started farming 10 years ago. And the pH started about five and a half. And after our initial seeding, we put top dressed two tons per acre of lime on the soil, brought the pH up to seven, and it's held steady there for the last eight years with no further amendment needed. When we started uh, our pastures, they were soybean fields farmed conventionally. A lot of fertilizer was put on them and a lot of glyphosate was put on them to grow the soybeans. When we inherited the soils, they were pretty much dead as far as we could see. No life in them, no bugs, no worms. And I think that was one thing that we wanted to bring back is that life because it's a part of the soil system and so important to maintaining fertility. Our initial seeding consisted of the following, 20% alfalfa, 20% timothy, 20% perennial ryegrass, 15% dual festulolium, which is a hybrid of fescue and ryegrass, 20% orchard grass, and about 5% a mixture of clover. We did not seed the dandelions, but it turns out the cattle love them, and they're only here for a little while in the spring. As I said, when we took over these fields, they were bare soybean stubble, lots of exposed soil. We worked that up with a drag harrow and a disc. Then we used a broadcaster to seed the fields and followed that with a cultipacker. Since the initial seeding, we've never done any overseeding. We've never had to apply any herbicides or any weed killers. And we've ne never needed to perform any aeration. I read a couple good scientific studies on aeration that I think were done very well that showed little or no benefit from aeration of fields except in the most heavily traveled areas, the headlands. So I've never seen that as a very good investment. One thing I do think are incredibly important in pastures are legumes, alfalfa and clover. Not that these send nitrogen straight into the soil for the other plants, but when their root nodules die off, then that nitrogen is released and it feeds the whole pasture. Plus the cows love them. Incidentally, alfalfa is one of the things that people told me not to plant in my pastures. They said that the crowns of the plants would get killed by hoof traffic. It hasn't happened. Our alfalfa has thrived over the 10 years. And these are the troublemakers we graze on our land. We have about 30 head of Dexter cattle, a small breed that tops out at around 800 pounds live weight. And we also graze about 1,000 head of poultry per year, chickens and turkeys. We graze the cattle from late April or early May all the way through till early to mid-December, and we feed hay for the rest of the year, both made ourselves and purchased in. Our fields consist of 25 acres of combined hay and pasture land where it's both pastured and made hay off of in a given year, and then four acres in dedicated hay land that's not fenced. Here's a diagram of how the fields are arranged. We have a central laneway that accesses almost all the fields, and the fields typically are around five acres. At one end of the laneway, there's what we call the grove. It's a shady area where the cattle can relax in the shade. There's mineral there, and there's access to water there. We don't use any chemical fertilizers to maintain soil fertility. Instead, 
we spread our winter bedding packs on the fields after they're composted for one year. And in addition to the cattle bedding pack, we also have the pig bedding packs and the chicken bedding packs and the offal that's composted from our chicken and other poultry butchering operations. A key to that fertility program is keeping a winter bedding pack. And winter bedding packs seem to be going out of style now. There's lots of folks talking about unrolling hay in the fields where the cattle graze in the wintertime or keeping hay in hay rings outside and feeding them outside. But keeping a winter bedding pack really suits us for a lot of reasons. The first and foremost reason is all those freeze-thaw cycles that I mentioned earlier on. Those freeze-thaw cycles create mud a lot more so than if the ground either stayed frozen or thawed. The second reason is winters can be unpredictable and brutal here. It can get really cold, a lot of wind coming off our western exposure, and the fields get really miserable to be in. For the cattle as well as us, it's a lot easier to manage the cattle, keep eyes on them if we have them having access to the barn with an outdoor winter pasture, and it's easier for us to collect the manure if they're eating inside. They're wasting less hay. We're able to collect the bedding pack. We're able to compost that bedding pack and focus where we want to put it on the farm. Keeping the bedding packs is one part of our nutrient balance and soil fertility equation. The other part is that we buy in about half of our hay every year, and we also purchase about 15 tons of feed for our pigs and our chickens and our turkeys every year and that's adding to the nutrient balance of our farm. So we're composting all that together and spreading it on the fields every spring just about the time the grass starts growing and our methodology for that spread is to do about half of the land every year and of that half to take one field and really put it heavy on that field and the way that field is identified is the year before I look at the forage growing conditions on all of our fields and I see which ones are lagging a little bit behind and focus the manure application the next spring on that field. How we graze our livestock. Chicken and turkeys are simple. Broilers get moved once a day. Laying hens and turkeys get moved once a week. With cattle, it's a little bit more complicated. We've tested about every type of grazing that I know of. We have strip grazed, mob grazed, cut grazed, and whole field grazed over the course of 10 years, testing each of them out in turn. And last year I found I had the best results with whole field grazing, about five acres at a time for our cattle. I felt it was less stressful on the cattle, which was very important to me. They were free to eat and eat until they were full. They had lots of land to do it in without complaining. They gained weight better. It was less work for us. We didn't have to move fences every year, just like we did with mob grazing. And the pastures recovered quicker, I think, than with mob grazing. And I think I saw less compaction. I, I'm just guessing here, but there was less compaction than there would be with mob grazing because you weren't clustering them all on a little spot of land where they paced back and forth for a whole day. And I'm not against mob grazing. I think what you do has to suit your particular conditions. What I see with me with mob grazing, if I had a herd 10 times the size of what I have, I think it would make more sense. It's just the herd size and the type of fields and the land and our climate. It's all particular to you. Let's move on to the single most important thing to growing luscious grass, in my opinion. It's not seeding, it's not anything else, it's how you manage the forest. And there's one rule that I use to manage forest through all the different grazing methods that we've used, and that is to always keep the grass in its prime growth mode. And that is between six or eight inches tall up to the point where it starts to shoot up a seed head and wants to go to seed. Always keep the grass in that phase. Let me go through a typical year and tell you how we do that. And with the caveat that no year is typical, which makes grazing always fun. The first thing we do in the year is in late April or May, we let the cows out on the pasture. And we do that when the grass is six to eight inches tall and we rotate them over all of our fields fairly quickly because the grass isn't growing quicker enough yet for them to stay on one field for a terribly long time, three, four, five days. And then as the grass growth starts to pick up, as you go through May and come into late May and the grass is actually growing faster than the cattle can eat it, we start to settle them down and they spend more time on selected fields. And we began to look at which fields we want to set aside for hay at that time. And we'll keep the cattle off of those fields until we make first cutting hay. 
In early June, we'll take our first cutting of hay, weather dependent of course, and we'll cut about 10 acres on the first cutting of hay, leaving the other 15 acres for the cattle to remain grazing on. By mid to late June, the 15 acres that I did not cut yet, that the cattle are still grazing on, is starting to get really ahead of us. In other words, it's starting to go to seed, or it's already gone to seed, and the cattle will pick over and not eat that seeded out stuff. So I start cutting those fields one field at a time, five acres of the 15, with a plan to go forward and cut five acres every two weeks in those three fields. By the time late July comes, the cows have picked out most everything that they'll eat out of that remaining acreage, whatever I have left, whatever I haven't cut yet. So I'll go through and sickle bar mow, clip as we call it, or topping I guess they call it overseas, the pastures that remain, everything that's gone seed, just drop that on the ground and leave it on the ground as mulch to insulate that soil during the coming worst month for us, which is August going into September, hot, dry weather. And I found that those fields that I clip or top will actually come back better than any fields in the fall for fall grazing. Wonderful, dense, tender growth. From sometime at this point or earlier, say early July, it's improvising. Depending on how the weather's going, you have to improvise. Improvisation determines whether we'll even get a second cut of hay off of. Sometimes the second cut on a field isn't even worth taking if it's in late August because I can put the cattle back on that land and graze them late. Now during all this, I'm also buying hay from the neighbors. I've found it's cheapest to buy hay when it's being made. Load it right onto the wagon, bring it back. The farmer doesn't have to deal with it. He usually gives you a break on the price. So we're loading up the hay barn while all this is going on. And speaking of hay, probably one year in three, we're actually feeding hay in August because it's too dry. And I would much rather pull the cattle off the fields, feed them hay for a couple weeks so that the fields, when it does rain, can recover faster without being eaten down to the ground. No shame in feeding hay during the dry spell. And if I lost you through all this month by month, blow by blow, all you gotta remember is one thing. Keep the grass within six to eight inches and coming out of the boot to go to seed. Just manage for that all summer long. What about weeds and ecological succession? How have our pastures changed over the years? Here's my experience with weeds. Really good forage growth, really healthy, strong forage growth of what you seeded will crowd out the weeds over time. Secondly, correct pH is key to keeping the weeds down. When we first seeded our fields, it was weeds everywhere. But after that lime kicked in, after I mowed them three times per year, the first two years, the stuff that we had seeded really started to thrive, crowded out the weed growth, keeping the grass down below that going to seed stage. So you're mowing everything down, including any weeds that have popped up, keeps it all in check. 10 years running, we have very little weed problems. The three weeds that we see in our fields is number one, dandelions this time of year, which I don't really view as a weed because the cattle eat them and they certainly don't take over the fields. The grass shades them out eventually. Number two is burdock. I hate burdock, but we try and mow it down before it dries out and the balls go to seed to keep it in check. And the third thing that we see is horse nettles, which come late in the season. They got barbed um, stems on them so the cattle won't touch them. Again, late season trimming, topping the pastures, controls the spread of those. Ecological succession is simply the change in species that you see in your fields over time. And conventional wisdom is that clover gradually goes away. Alfalfa is not good in pasture. You gotta try things for yourself. What I found in terms of ecological succession is that although we only seeded 5% clover to begin with, we had 20% alfalfa, the 20% alfalfa has remained. The clover in the early years just exploded. We had much more than 20% clover in our fields, even though we only seeded 5%. And then because of the way of the regimen that we always keep our fields down, we don't let them sit at seed height for very long, if at all, the clover never gets out competed height-wise by the bladed grasses, and neither does the alfalfa. And they've both maintained a steady 
10% alfalfa, 20% alfalfa, 20% alfalfa. Alfalfa is the late season star for us. When the weather dries out in August, alfalfa is nice and deep rooted and clover too. And they'll be the things that are take over our pasture and what the cows are chomping on come August time. As far as the bladed grasses, the timothy, the rye, the orchard grass, they've settled in fairly, I would say, stably. So we see each of them dominant at different times of the year. The orchard grass comes in first thing in the spring and shoots up to seed. And then the timothy comes in as it gradually gets a little warmer and the rye. So we have seen ecological succession but it hasn't been detrimental to the overall health of our pasture. We've seen a continued stability in the original seeding that we did, and a lot of that has to do with the regimen for taking care of the grass. I've talked about a lot of good things that have happened on our fields, but we do have our problem children. Everything's not wine, roses, and clover. Everyone's bound to run into some problem or another in their field maintenance and we're not the exception to that rule. We have two fields that are problem children right now. I'm sitting in one of them. This is what we call our middle field. This is the field that I heavily manured this year and the problem in this field is we have nice dense growth and all the species that we want but we don't get the volume over the course of the growing season that there are other fields produce. And it's been this way for a couple years. And here's my diagnosis for it. We heavily grazed this field for two or three years when we were overstocked. We had too many cattle for our land. And at the same time, we were using strip grazing, which is a kind of mob grazing where we were putting a lot of stock on a small piece of ground and moving them every day. And I think that the root cause of the problem with this field is compaction. I think that's why I'm seeing growth the way, to the, the way that it is. So what is the solution to that? The solution to that is to heavily apply compost as I did this year and that's a natural aeration method because earthworms and other critters work up through the surface of the ground to eat that stuff that I spread and bring it back down to the ground and I'm doing natural aeration. So in combination with not letting the cattle onto this field as often and just taking hay off of it, I'm expecting in a couple years that I can bring this field back to what it was. This is the corner field where we run our laying chickens, our broiler chickens, and our turkeys. Three acres, and it's our other problem child. There's lots of benefits to run poultry on pasture, but I don't think the health of the pasture is one of them. Contrary to popular wisdom, in my experience, over 10 years, chickens are real hard on pastures, and they, there's a couple ways that they're hard on pasture. Number one, they're dropping raw manure, which is really hot in nitrogen, right on the pasture, and that raw manure is not very good for the pasture. It burns the soil and the plants. Second thing is the chickens dig. Pretty much no matter how fast you move them around, we move our broilers once a day, and our laying hens once a week and our turkeys once a week, they're gonna dig. And once they dig and they open up a spot of bare ground, they create a place where weeds can take hold. And this is where we see the most burdock in this pasture. What's the solution here? Well, we could move them to a different field, but this field is very convenient. It's right out from our barn. It's easy to get water to. It's easy for us to truck in and out of here multiple times a day to take care of the chickens. So they're staying on this field. The solution is to reduce the loading on the field. We're running less or fewer chickens, broilers per box this year and still moving them every day. And we're running much fewer laying hens and moving them once a week. The, the, the damage to this field will continue, I'm sure, but through the application of compost and a lesser loading, I think we can mitigate that. And that's the way we grow luscious grass. Your results may be different. I'm trying to illustrate here that it's an improvisational thing and there's a few hard and fast rules like the growth stage you wanna harvest the grass, but the rest is gonna vary. What you seed, your climate, all that stuff. What I do say to be wary of is anybody telling you that they have the one solution, the one method that everybody should use because the best way to find the method that works best for you is kind of scientific. That's the way you do it. You try something, you measure the results as best you can, even if it's just keeping a journal, and then you adjust based on the results to look for a better in outcome. That's really what it is. It's not somebody 
declaring they found the solution. There's many solutions depending on your circumstances. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.